On tonight's virtual Bible study, we want to talk about uh, questions that we might get asked uh, quite often. A lot of moral issues in our world today, and as Christians, we're often put on the spot to try to give a, an answer to people who likely disagree with us on important moral issues, and we need to be ready to give a real quick answer, and that's what we're going to try to do now. We've got uh, almost a dozen different moral questions. We're actually going to put ourselves on a timer, Jacob, and see how quick we can answer and limit our answers to the kind of things we might be able to do uh, on the spot. All right, so you'll want to stay tuned to this. The Virtual Bible Study gets started right after this. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 Three one three eight one four five six seven, or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com. We hope you'll take out your Bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of God's Word on this edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And we welcome you to the Virtual Bible Study for Thursday, June twenty second, 2017. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be with you Glad tonight. Glad to have you here as well. And uh, Josh is behind the controls. Josh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's going to be, be a fast program, Josh, but we're going to want some answers from you, so get them ready. And of click on the draw. And we'll let want your questions as well. Send them to questions at collegeview.com, your answers, your, your comments, or better yet, send them in the chat room. If you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, we're there. You can sign in the chat room there or uh, sign in the chat room in our website, uh, thevirtualbiblestudy.com, where you can chat with other listeners on the program tonight. We'll look forward to your comments. As we said, it's going to be rapid fire tonight as we look at various moral issues, and those moral issues are often presented to us in real life in rapid fire. You know, Jacob, no I, might be, yeah, I might be at a coffee break table at work, and somebody... Uh, tries to give me a little grief about what I believe about uh, watching dirty movies. You didn't know it was coming. I didn't even know it was coming, but I need to be able to give him... That's that's a great opening. I, that, I, that, that's a time I need to be ready to give him an answer. Yeah. Or maybe someone asked me my position on um, social drinking. And, and we could sit down and talk for hours about that sure. topic, and we have done that before, but typically in our, in our kind of contacts with people... We're not going to have that long time. We we got to have a quick, ready answer. That might lead to something more, but we got to have that first ready answer. And uh, that that ready answer needs to be a quick one and a, a good one. Yeah, you need to have a good argument ready. If, if we throw out some kind of cheesy answer, the guy will just dismiss us or and, it, and I mean, never it's, want it's, to talk it anymore. It would be about good it. in context, but not you. You'd have to develop it. If yeah. you, we want a quick, powerful punch here that that makes the case. Yeah. So here's the topics I sent well, out. Oh, do you want to do that? Or do you want to give them, just hit them sort of oh, out well, of the blue? Yeah, we'll just hit them out of the blue because it's, I put these out on our uh, update earlier today, uh, and some and whoever's on our update list got these already knows the almost. I think I got eleven. I don't think I got twelve topics, uh, but I figured with the time we have and with our breaks and with the uh, lead-ins and so forth, we're gonna we're gonna give ourselves four and a half minutes. Uh, on I got I got my timer ready to go here, and we're gonna put ourselves on the timer. Well, I thought I had it yeah, ready okay, to go. Okay, now, so here's the um, deal. We're not going to give you warning tonight, so you'll have to formulate your answer, your response, in four and a half minutes as well, and send it in the chat room. We'll see how quickly you can get your answers in. Josh, you're, well, you've already seen the questions, Josh. Right. You've already seen the topics. i got a little head start. But yeah. you still, you're going to have to answer quick. All right. uh, anyway, if it, you didn't get this update, we'll, before we get started, we'll remind you, you can be on our update list by sending us an email to questions at collegeview.com. Just say, add me to the list, yeah, and we'll do it. All right, and get your bumper sticker there, too. If yeah, you want to yeah. Us and, we, and we may be ordering some new bumper stickers oh, soon, so, we we, oh, yeah, so okay. we'll, we'll, we'll update you on that as we go. All right. All right, so first <laughs> topic. How would I prove and how would I answer someone who challenges me on my position? This is my position. It's your position. It's Josh's position. Social drinking is wrong. Drinking alcohol at, in any quantity is wrong. We should not be consuming intoxicating alcoholic drink. Uh, and uh, we're on the clock and go. All Check right. It. Send your emails, uh, send your comments in uh, the chat room to this question. What about social drinking? 
Uh, is it something that we ought to be doing? Well, uh, we have several passages we could look at. Um, 1 Timothy 5.23 shows us that first century Christians were not drinking alcohol. They had to be instructed to drink alcohol. I like that one. Paul told Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. What that verse does, sometimes drinkers try to use that verse to prove something, but what it actually proves is, here's Timothy. He was a faithful first century Christian, and he didn't drink any at all. He had to be instructed to drink some for a medicinal benefit, but his typical practice was to drink none at all. Here's a faithful young Christian in the first century. That was the practice. All right. Uh, Josh, your answer. Um, I'd look at 1 Peter 4, verse 3, uh, where it says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So he he talks about drinking there, and that's the our time past in life is... Gentiles, and he, he condemns all those things. Yeah, excessive wine. That's a real good word study. We won't have time for the whole word right. study, but the, the three expressions, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, they, they go sort of most down least, but, it, uh, but all three of those statements are less than drunkenness. Yeah. So I think everybody says, oh, yeah, you can't get drunk. Okay, well, here are three terms that describe drinking at lower levels than drunkenness. Excess wine, then even less revelings, then banquetings. If you don't believe us, do a word study on them. But especially banquetings refers to drinking without reference to quantity, and it says don't do it. All right, I think so, that's social drinking. Yeah. That's what it's talking about. All right, so uh, what we need, that, that, that argument, though, however, probably is not going to be able to be developed in four and a half minutes because you need to do some, some background material there. You may not have that at your ready disposal. Here's one that you can't have at your ready disposal. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. There you're told to be sober. Now, those in the Alcoholics Anonymous know what that means. Not a lot of people in our society know what that means, but the Greek word means what the Alcoholic Anonymous people think sober means, and that means you don't drink at all. Free of intoxicants. Free from intoxicants. Look up Strong's, look up Vines, look how they define that word in the original Greek. It means to be free from the influence of intoxicants. Why do people drink a beer with their dinner? Why do they have a glass of wine when they get home from work? For the effect of the intoxicant. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says to be free from that, to be sober, we might look at it in the context of the roaring lion walking around seeking who may devour. If there was a real roaring lion at the dinner table with us, we wouldn't want to take a drink just to take the edge off to be influenced by that intoxicant. No, we would want to be free from the influence of intoxicants. That's the command, First Peter 5, verse 8. Got a couple emails in today in response to our update. One was from Kent in Georgia. He, he suggests First Peter 4, 3 that Josh brought up. It would be his answer. Um, and then we got a, an email from Chris in Atlanta. I hadn't heard from Chris in a good while. Great to hear from you again, Chris. He also, he says, it would be tough to cover with a quick verse or two, but he said, I would mention 1 Peter 4, 3 again and show the progression of drunkenness, crowding, drinking parties. So I think that's really, I think that's a good argument. Uh, he said, I would also point out the importance of being a godly example by using Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men wow. that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is now. I think that's a great argument. I don't know how anybody gets around it. I, I'm going to go up to somebody's door and try to talk, invite them to church and, and talk to them about Jesus. And I got a beer in my hand. Would I do that? Do that. Because everybody knows that's a negative on your influence, and nobody nobody's going to go there. And so, you know, there, there's just so many arguments. I don't understand why we have to argue so much about social drinking, even with some of our own brethren. Out of time. Out of time. I thought that was a fire drill or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the fire drill on this one's over. Let's go on to the next okay. one. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's how, a little, how do I stop yeah, that? Yeah, there you go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, so we're going to go on. That got, that got me off guard yeah. there. It did. Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's your social drink. I think those are answers. I think those answers at work. Let's go to the next one. Okay. What about, uh, this is kind of related. What about smoking? Okay. Uh, how would you talk to someone and tell them that they ought not to smoke? tobacco or for that matter use tobacco we're on the clock go all right well Kent in Georgia su submits first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 first Corinthians 6 verse 20 says for you're bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's 
he would make the argument that this simply doesn't glorify God. Okay, I, th I think that's a good argument. Uh, it would probably be apt to a lot of things. I think we're supposed to take care of ourselves, uh, physically take care of ourselves, and not do things that are detrimental, and I, I think that would work. Uh, also, I, uh, from Chris, he said, I would point out the importance of being a good steward over what God has given us. This is not... This not only includes our finances, but our bodies as well. I would also say that this would apply not only to smoking, but gluttony, taking foolish risks that unnecessarily place us in harm's way. I think he would go also with 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. Okay. That's a verse that I had in my answer. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, I think it works. That's, I think that's sort of been the go-to verse for a long time. People trying to encourage folks against smoking. We know smoking is harmful. Now, here's, here's one of the arguments that people make. Well, I, I might smoke, but you eat too much. Well, okay, we can talk about eating too much. But here's the difference. I have to eat some. I don't have to smoke any. And so it's really a flawed comparison. You can't really compare the two. I mean, I, I agree. We should be careful about how we... Uh, what we eat, uh, get our exercise, do things to maintain our physical health as much as possible. We all know we get old, we get decrepit, but it's going to happen. But we, can, we, we shouldn't hasten the process by poor stewardship, as Chris says. Um, and then I, uh, a verse you like to use a lot of times, Jacob, is Romans 14, verse 23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Can any smoker really say, this is a good thing? I know this is a good thing, and I would actually encourage you to smoke too. Have you ever heard a smoker say that? No. Every smoker I've ever talked to, this is a nasty bad habit. I'm sorry I ever got started. Don't you ever make the mistake of getting started smoking tobacco because it's really hard to quit once you get started. All right. And I, I, would, I would go back to that passage that, uh, that Chris used in his first answer, Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our society looks upon those who are smoking, not from a biblical point of view, but just a worldly point of view, is that's not a good thing. That, yeah. That's not something that's exemplary. And actually, I th actually think our culture has actually changed a little bit in a better direction on this question right. over the last couple of decades. I can remember 30, 40 years ago when you went to church, you'd have to fight your way through a fog of tobacco smoke to get in the door because even church people would stand outside and smoke before they came in. So you don't see that anymore. But I think our society in general has realized smoking is a bad thing, at least for your health, if not for your spiritual well-being. It's a bad thing for health. Uh, I, I really, it doesn't seem like we have to argue that as much with people as, as we used to. But I tell you, let me give you another verse. We've apparently still got some time. Our timer hasn't gone off yet. Let's see here. Did I get that thing started? Oh, boy. All oh, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. We're almost out of time. I would, I would use 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, where Paul says, I will not be brought under the power or bondage of anything. And I think that would apply to all things addictive. Nicotine is addictive. And, and Paul said, don't let yourself be under the influence or power of things that control you. I won't be brought under the power of anything, he said. And, and that principle, not being, not being one who uses addictive substances, would certainly be applicable. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Yeah. And, uh, and again, you, you mentioned I had in my list Matthew 5, 16 to be an example, be an influence. There we okay. go. Well, okay. let's clear the room. All right. All right. Uh, let's take a break. We, let's grab a break. We'll come back. We've got to hurry on. And there's more questions along these lines. You won't want to go anywhere. We're not going to tell you what they are. We want to catch you off guard, see how you would answer. Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study will continue right after this. Have you checked out all of the resources on collegeview.com lately? Check it out now while you listen to these important messages. The Virtual Bible Study will be right back after this. Hello everyone, I'm Wade Shelton, a member of the College View Church of Christ. If you're like me, you've probably heard a lot of rumors about what the Church of Christ is all about. But regardless of what the rumors you may have heard, let me just quickly tell you what we are about. The College View Church of Christ is simply a group of Christians that is committed to doing everything that God has commanded us in exactly the way that He commanded us to do it. So we just simply open our Bibles and study them to determine what God has commanded us to do, and then we try to do it. It's just really that simple. Are you interested in being part of a group of people who have the God? If so, I hope you will join me and my family as we worship God with the College View Church of Christ this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Here's some quotes worth pondering. 
He who slings mud generally loses ground. He that will not command his thoughts will soon lose the command of his actions. He who receives a good turn should never forget it. He who does one should never remember it. He is happy whose circumstances suit his temper, but he is more excellent who can suit his temper to any circumstances. Man, wish I'd said that. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3, 17. Now, back to the program. And we're back on the program tonight, and uh, we're taking various questions, various moral questions that we might get asked on a sort of a spur-of-the-moment kind of situation, and asking how would you answer. Get a, have a quick, ready answer. It might lead to a longer discussion. Hopefully it will, but you got to have that first answer ready to go. How are you going to answer? Don't let it catch you off guard. Uh, Here, go ahead. On our Facebook page, Sean is in there and commented about the drinking question. Uh, uh, first... Uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 5, uh, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Wine has the least amount of alcohol in it, but when you are filled with the Spirit, there's no room for oh, good intoxicants. Point. Thanks, Sean. All right. Thanks, Sean, for being there. All right. Let's go on. So we talked about drinking. We talked about sweet. But you can imagine, Jacob, the thought here is these are the kinds of things that come up when we have chances to interact with, with our friends, uh, neighbors, family members, co-workers. These kind of discussions come up, and we need to be the kind of people who have a reputation for knowing our Bibles and being able to give Bible answers to questions like this. Uh, and I really, I really think we need to develop that reputation. We used to have it, I think, as a, as a group. We used to have it more than we do now, but we need to have that kind of reputation we're ready to answer. All right. All right, so here's the next one on our list. What about dancing? Uh, uh, people find out that we are against dancing. They're going to wonder why, because dancing is also popular, especially the prom in the springtime. We're on the clock. Let's go. All right. Well, we need to first define what kind of dance we'd be opposed to, and that would be the lewd dances, the dances that uh, were, would uh, serve to incite certain passions. Yeah, yeah. Chris uh, mentioned that in his email. He said, I would not agree that it's always wrong for a Christian to dance. I see no issues with a husband and wife dancing in the privacy of their own home. Okay. Uh, uh, so that's a good clarification yep. to make. All right. But he said, I would take issue with lewd modern dances would offer up Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, which is, of course, that listing of the works of the flesh. And among those is the is the sin of lasciviousness. Uh, you know, people, I've had lots of people say, where does the Bible say, thou shalt not dance? Or specifically, where does the New Testament say? They dance some, they did do some dancing in the Old Testament. We yeah. read about some kinds of celebratory dancing in the Old Testament. Yeah. Thou shalt not dance. And remember, the kind of dancing we're talking about is the lewd modern dancing the kind that, that kids do at the prom, the kind that kids do when they go to school dances and this that sort of thing. This isn't the end zone dance. No. This, the, and maybe not even certain kind of folk dances. Yeah. This, this is, this is but, but and, and I really think that's a, a quibble people want to make, and they know what we're talking about when we condemn dancing. They know what we're talking there about. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think the answer is from Galatians 5, beginning verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He go, I won't go on to read them all. But he says, I, uh, the which... I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So lasciviousness is one of the things that's going to keep us out of heaven. But lasciviousness is a word that we don't use in normal daily conversation. and We just go right over the head of most people. So you almost have to be ready with a, with a technical definition of that term. Uh, Thayer says that lasciviousness is, quote, wanton acts or manners as... Filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. It sounds like he was writing about modern lewd dancing when he talked about indecent bodily movements and in unchaste or unpure handling of males and females. All right. That, uh, that, 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 that nails it right there. And if you... Uh if, if someone wants to argue, they're going to have to argue with that word because it's so clear. Yeah, yeah. and Kent uh, in his references email well. also references that same one. So, uh, I, again, we, got, we may have a little extra time here because well, I, I think that's such a definitive answer. Uh, wh whenever the subject of dancing comes up, 
remember that word lasciviousness and and that's not the only place in the new testament where la, the word lasciviousness is found but that's that's the best one because in the context of it says if you do it you're not going to heaven and and how could anybody argue that josh yeah i was going to go to the same place the works of the flesh but when you're when you're doing those type of dances that we're talking mm -hmm. about i mean you're can you do that type of dance and not have your mind go to the wrong place? And, exactly. and you can't. I mean, exactly. it's going to incite sexual interest. And exactly. That's where your mind's going to go. And then, you know, it goes back to what Jesus said. That's looking upon a woman. And that's what lasciviousness is. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to, and it doesn't have to be male and female. It can just be one gender dancing in front of others. We remember Herodias' wife. I mean, Herodias' daughter, daughter dancing in front of Herod. Uh, that seems to be a, a, a sexually charged dance that she But was people, doing. here's the argument. Kids only are in high school once. They only get to go to the prom once. It's such a special time. I think the answer to that is it is true. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to take a stand for what's morally right. Yeah. You know, and so teach our kids to do that. Don't, don't, don't make them feel like they've missed out. Make them feel like they're really taking a stand for what's right, and uh, later on they will they won't regret having done the right thing. All right, okay, good good discussion there. Next right. question. The next question has and to they're do... and they're deadly silent in the chat room tonight. By the way, I, don't, I think they're shocked we're going so fast. Well, they fast. can't uh, they can't type that fast. So yeah. here we go. <laughs> All right, so get in here. This one's on modesty. Okay, uh, this is a huge problem in the world. So. We, we are going to have opportunities and, and uh, situations are going to present themselves where we have a chance to talk to people about modesty. What points are you going to make about modesty? The clock starts now. All right. I'll go to G Genesis chapter 3 because I think this would probably be the more commonly understood to, uh, passage or story along these lines uh, where the account of Adam and Eve when they sinned, uh, they sewed uh, aprons of fig leaves for themselves and when God came around they hid and he tells them or Adam tells God he after he had these aprons of fig leaves on, something that covered their midsection, uh, Adam said in verse 10 of chapter 3 of Genesis, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam knew that he still wasn't adequately, adequately covered. God agreed that he wasn't adequately covered. And so he made uh, tunics for them that covered them more thoroughly, uh, indicating there are standards for modesty. Yeah, I think from that, no, in other words, the word nakedness is used there, and that's a word that's repeated throughout both the Old and New Testament. Nakedness is always associated with shame and sinfulness. But I think from the very earliest reference to it there in the Garden of Eden, you get the idea that, the torso of the body and the legs, at least down to the knee, if not below, of that part of your flesh is an exposure of nakedness. And so we should avoid exposing our nakedness. In fact, an interesting, we won't take time to develop it thoroughly, but in Exodus 28, especially at verse 42, it describes the priest's garments that were to be made for the priest to wear. And it actually describes some undergarments that they were wearing. They were called linen breeches, but they went from the waist to the knee to cover their thighs so that their nakedness would not be exposed if someone happened to see up under their robes as they were going about their duties as priests. So I think pretty clearly the torso of the body the leg down to the knee at least if uh, a lot of times those tunics went a lot all the way to the ground uh, but that that is the area of naked I think is important is as Christians our obligation is not only to avoid nakedness exposing our nakedness but we we actually have a higher standard set for us and it's described in first Timothy chapter 2 uh, verse 9 uh, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. And so modesty and shamefacedness, that describes someone who's not going to just try to see how close to the limits they can go. If there isn't, a, you know, a lot of times we hear people say there are no absolute limits. You can't draw a line. I don't know how many Christians I've heard say, oh, you can't draw a line. There's no absolutes. I think those, those are absolutes. Nakedness is repeated in both the Old and New Testament. Always shameful. Avoid the nakedness. We can find a definition of, of the areas of the body that constitute nakedness. That's an absolute. That's an absolute. You Mod stay, 
And then modesty says you don't even try to see how close you can get. Modesty, modesty is not an absolute, but when you're crossing those lines, you're getting close to those lines of nakedness, then certainly you're, you're crossing that line. Exactly right. All right. Josh, anything? Yeah, I, I was going to go along with what you said in First Timothy 2, but really we're, as Christians, we're, we're representing Christ. I mean, we're, we're letting our light shine, and if we don't have a sense of shame, I think people have lost their sense of shame altogether, yeah. and, and that's what it talked about, shamefacedness. But we're representing Christ to people, and if we don't have enough, if we're not well put together, we're, we're showing a poor example, I think. All right. But you know, it's, it's sad to me that the only people who really want to argue what's behind all of this is Christians. Christians try to act like they, they don't know. You talk to people in the world and ask them, why do girls expose these parts of their bodies? Why do guys run around with their shirts off? They're, they're yeah. honest enough to tell you it's to attract the opposite sex. Yeah. But Christians, for some reason, want to argue that point. Yeah, your timer's going off. I think. Is that the timer? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and then answers first. Chris from Atlanta mentions First Timothy 2, verse 9, which states women should be modest. This would certainly apply to men as well. Thank you, Chris, for that. And then um, Kent says, references Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you, whosoever looks at a woman to lust, after, uh, lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so... Uh, Kent says that uh, that appearance and those and what you're displaying can cause others to sin. On on Facebook, uh, uh, Shane in Murfreesboro says, with modesty and dress, it's also good to consider is how I'm dressing glorifying God. He, he mentions Ephesians, or excuse me, emphasis on First Corinthians six, beginning verse nineteen, is how I'm dressing becoming a stumbling block to others that they might sin. Luke seventeen, beginning verse one. Or even some of the other principles that we've already mentioned. Uh, how many passages emphasize that the body itself, whether physically or visually, are for the spouse alone? Thank right. you for those uh, comments. There is, a, there is a sanctity of marriage that, that goes into I'd this I'd like argument. to touch on what, one thing Shane mentioned there about uh, what, we're, what we're displaying. You know, the way we dress tells a lot about us. Proverbs 7, verse 10 talks about a woman who came to a man in the attire. You can tell what a harlot, by the way, she dresses. You can tell other people, by Should the way. Should be able to tell a Christian, by can, the way, dresses. Right. You can tell a farmer, by the way, he dresses, or an auto mechanic. Can they look at me and say, there's something about him that he's he's trying to be a Christian? Uh, certainly, we can display a lot, by the way. Real dress. quick, Mike J. in the chat room says, uh, some people say that you can't draw a line of where clothes should extend to. However, if you say there isn't a definite line, now you've opened up a whole new problem because that indicates that you can wear anything and it would be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah People no. don't really think there's not a line. They know there's a line. They would draw and argue about it. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you say anything short of uh, being naked is not acceptable, then you've drawn a line somewhere. Yeah. All right. yeah. We're getting short on time. We're totally we went over on that. Let's grab our um, break, Jake. Is it time for a break? Already? Yeah, and then we got to keep. We got to keep on the clock now. Okay, no more. No more letting it slide here. We're going to get a break. This get to this week's bullet point and get your thoughts. Don't go anywhere. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. This is Greg Wynn with this week's bullet point. A nearby denominational church advertises that it has two worship services each Sunday morning. One is traditional and the other is called contemporary. While we have not visited either one, we suspect that these distinctions indicate that the first follows the routine patterns that have been observed in that denomination for many years. The contemporary service, on the other hand, likely breaks those long-standing practices and seeks to attract a younger, more religiously liberated crowd. The whole notion of choice in the matter of worship is what deserves our attention. Choice is good, even preferable, in many realms. We would be upset if we had no freedom to choose houses, cars, clothes, food, and so forth. In these areas, we have a preference, and we act upon it. We allow that others may choose differently, and that is okay. To each his own, we say. But men have mistakenly concluded that we are also free to choose what we like in worship specifically and in religion generally. The church of your choice was a popular slogan many years ago. We don't hear that phrase much anymore, but we certainly see that concept has taken root. The denominations are full of people who have sought and found what appeals to them. What God wants, what he has commanded and authorized, seems to be of little concern thought that, quote, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. 
This important verse emphasizes two key aspects of acceptable worship. It must be in spirit, indicating that the Father expects a sincere, heartfelt service. Without it, he is not pleased, Matthew 15, verse 8. But our worship must also be in truth, that is, in accordance with the commands of the Scripture. Those who do not submit to the authority of God's law will not be saved, Matthew 7, beginning verse 21. Traditional or contemporary is the choice offered by men, but the only right choice is to serve God according to the truth of scriptures. Anything else is an eternal mistake. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. Hi, my name is Jack. I am eight years old, and this is Vulture Bible Study. We're waiting to hear from you. Call in right now and join in on the virtual Bible study. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program tonight, and we're reminded this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ. Not much time to talk about it tonight, but you can find out more about us at our, our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. We're talking about uh, quick questions to moral quick answers. answers to moral quick, questions. Quick answers to moral questions, not quick answers to moral or Quick questions to moral answers. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about uh, next. What, what's the next? Okay, question? we're going to we're going to we're going to have to cut our time a little bit shorter. We're going to stay on the clock to get done tonight. But our purpose is to to sort of emphasize we need to have a quick, ready answer on lots of topics. And I think that will open up a door to more thorough discussions, but we got to have that first good, ready answer. The next one that we want to talk about, and we're on the clock now, what about abortion? How are you going to answer abortion? Well, uh, let's go to our listeners first. Kent Ranch references Psalm 106, verse 38, and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. And uh, certainly in those Old Testament times, they were offering child sacrifices to the gods, and that certainly was something that God detested and punished them for, and people are doing the same today. Yeah. Um, Chris mentions Psalm 139, yeah. verse 13. 13 and 14. For you formed my, uh, my inner parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillful, skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance. Yet being yet formed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of, were none of them. Okay. So he references the fact that that, that was that formed David was formed in the womb. Uh, Chris makes an interesting observation. I I want to know why they consider a discovery of a single cell organism on Mars would be life. But a fetus in the womb is not. That's amazing. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you, Chris. I, I don't think I heard that before. A, a really good argument is from an Old Testament text. We admit we don't live under the Old Testament. But in Exodus 21, beginning verse 22, it won't take time to read all that. You might make a note of that because I think it's a really good argument. If you harmed a woman who was pregnant and she miscarried, you would be punished. But if the child died... If, the, if it led to a miscarriage and the fetus died, you would be punished as though you had killed a man. Same punishment. And it showed that the, the, quality, the equality of life there between an unborn child and a living person. Yep, right. And then a good argument from the New Testament has to do with Mary, the mother of Jesus. She went to see her cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. John the Baptist actually was about six months older than Jesus. Right. Uh, their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth, were cousins. And Elizabeth said, when Mary came to her, she said, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Now, the, the Greek word there for babe is brephos. Uh, then go to chapter 2 of Luke. Remember, Luke was a physician. In chapter 2 of Luke, verse 16, the uh, shepherds came. It says, they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph, and the babe in a manger. The word babe there is also brephos. So the Greek would use the same word for a baby in the womb and a baby born, uh, which is another argument showing that God sees that as a human life, and we don't have the right to take it. Josh? Yeah, I was going to mention Proverbs 6, uh, about the Whoa. seven things that God hates, and one of them is hands that shed innocent shed, blood. There you go. And what could be more innocent blood than an unborn child? Yeah, right? 60, 97 says, I love Psalm 139. David uses the fact that God saw him in the womb as evidence God will kill the wicked. Thank you for that. Uh, and Kristen in, on Facebook says, I read an article today about a pregnant woman who already had one baby and said she only wants one, so she wants an abortion. So her doctor suggested, okay, let's kill the child you already have and give you time to prepare for your new one. And you can guess how that went over. The mom didn't like that answer. 
good. I think that's a good argument. If I can kill the one in the womb, let's keep the one in the womb. Let's kill this one that's already born. No, no, can't do that. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, time's gotta, up. Got to go. Okay. Next question. And this one's going to come up too. Homosexuality. Is it an acceptable lifestyle? Is it okay uh, to be homosexual, to live a homosexual lifestyle? The clock starts now. All right. Go. You can answer this question easily if you'll just remember Romans chapter 1 because it makes the argument in sort of an open and cl- cl- uh, close case. When it talks about the fact that the people were becoming so wicked in verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 is very difficult uh, to get around that God does not approve of that behavior. Exactly right. I like also 1 Corinthians 6, beginning verse 9, the New American Standard Version. A newer translation, instead of the King James, makes it clear, although the King James is clear, but it uses some terms that we don't use commonly. The New American Standard says, Do you not know, this is 1 Corinthians 6, beginning verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, all of those other sins, we would understand. And and, and actually, the next verse goes on to say, and such were some of you. Uh, All of those other sins, we would say a person has to stop doing that. You can't keep being a drunkard. You've got to quit being a drunkard. Or you can't keep stealing. You have to stop being a thief if you want to be saved. You got to stop practicing homosexuality if you want to be saved as well. I just, I just think it's uh, very straightforward in that text. All right. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of opportunities to talk about this. Uh, w- one of the arguments the homosexuals make is that the Bible only condemns hom- pr- promiscuous homosexual activity, and I would just challenge them to to show that, demonstrate that in in the text that only promiscuous homosexuality is being condemned. The the statements are just too clear. All right. Uh, Josh, any comments before we move on? Because we can make up up some time here, I think. Uh, Well, Matthew 19, verse verse 4, Jesus said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. There's your positive authority. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jesus, perfect teacher. All right. Yeah, if you have positive authority, and if it specifies what God authorizes, then other kinds of relationships would be excluded. So that ma- that makes the argument plainly, too. All right, guest 6097 asked, did you, all, did you all cover the marijuana, we cover using marijuana in the smoking section? No, we did not cover it in the smoking section. We actually covered it in the drinking well, section. But actually, both of them. Bo- bo- well, go back and look at both our responses, and I think the, the, the verses we use would apply to marijuana smoking as well. All right. Okay. All right. We're wait a minute. This thing is going to go off here. We just we just concluded homosexuality, right? Okay. All right. Now, so the next question there. is. All right. Got the buzzer. All right. Now, our next topic that we want to cover is what about watching filthy movies and nasty TV shows? Uh, I think here's an opportunity for us to really do some teaching. Because I know, I know way too many people who, are, who identify themselves as Christians who have absolutely no reservation at all about the kind of things that they'll go to see in the movies, the kind of things they'll watch on TV. And what's shocking to me is that they'll even talk about it and, and commend those kind of things. So this is going to be an opportunity to open up a conversation. How are you going to do it? How are you going to respond to people about what they watch? You're on the clock. All right. Well, uh, I like Chris's answer. He says, one of my favorite verses in the Bible covers this, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We're in a, in a battle, a spiritual battle with the devil, not only in what we do, but the way we think. He's trying to get us to change the way that we think so that we're not lining up with what God the way God thinks about sin and evil, and we've got to make sure that we're doing what Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says. And, and, and the reason why that's so important is because God, who made us, knows, that, knows what psychologists tell us, and that is thoughts precede actions. 
If I think about something all the time, I will eventually act out on what I've been thinking about. Proverbs and, 23, verse 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Exactly. And so um, I've, got to, I've got to control my thought processes or I'm going to go farther and farther away from God. It's very, very important. Might throw in a quick plug here. Coming up in July, July 24th and 25th, that's a Monday and a Tuesday night, we're going to have the community Bible study. Our right. annual community Bible study here in Columbia is going to be about the plague of pornography. Right. And it's, and we'll talk more about that leading up to it. But uh, it's a huge problem. Right. And, and, and it's, it's just like a cancer because 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you would, the kind of stuff they're showing on T, even on TV, let alone the movies, would never have even been imaginable. But now we just see this continual creep toward more and more right. horrible images and ungodly activities that are acted out. And, of course, the special effects, uh, the, the, the filmography, I guess, if you would have it, is so much better now than it used to be. It's, it's so graphic. And, and our minds are just like a sponge. Mm -hmm. And we store those images in our subconscious mind. They're there. Once you see it, it's in there. Yeah. And you don't get it out. It, it, it'll be there permanently. And, and we've got to control what we're seeing. All right. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so that certainly is uh, critical, Josh, that we're thinking about things the right way. Yeah, Psalm 101, uh, verse 2 says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. A when wilt thou come unto me, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So David David wrote that psalm. You know, he uh, he made the poor decision of, of looking upon something that he shouldn't have, and it got him into trouble. And so you see how he can I, I say I know people even put that verse 3 on their computer monitor. I will set no wicked thing before mine psalm eyes. Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Where to hate evil? Like the Lord hates evil. How can we say we're, we hate evil if we're seeking it out into television? And, and, and then movies? Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five twenty eight: Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. Uh, so understand, you can sin just by what you see, and plenty of people are doing it. All right, let's do one more before the break. Oh, you want to do one more? One more. Okay. Uh, the next one is. Let me turn my page. The next one is divorce for any and every cause, not okay. Not okay. When, when people find out that we say that, that actually the Bible is very restrictive about who can divorce and remarry, we're going to get a lot of pushback. How are you going to answer when, when you try to tell people divorce for any and every cause is not okay? Go. Matthew 19, verse 9, And I say to you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. There's only one reason there why you can uh, dissolve that marriage, and that is for the sin of adultery. Exactly that's right. what it says. Now, that's yeah. the only, and if you could find some other passage that would say, oh, it's, it's okay for other reasons, then we'd have to acknowledge those, but that's the only uh, statement that we have, or the only condition we have, that, that is, Jesus says is acceptable to get a divorce. I think that's right. right. Um, uh, Kent references Matthew 19, verse 9. Uh, and Matthew 5.32 is another good one. 5.32 is referenced by Chris, as well as Romans 7, verse 23. Um, Romans chapter 7, verse 23 states, uh, let's see here, it says, uh, for I see you know, my law and other members warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is, I think he uh, is maybe referencing verse 3 of Romans yeah. chapter 7. So, two and three, yeah. So if, the, if then while the, her husband lives, she marries another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the, that law so that she's woman no adulteress. Bound, doesn't verse 2 use the word a woman is bound yeah, by the law? Yeah, she's bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, another good one. This is an Old Testament statement that we maybe don't reference as often as we should, but it's so plain. Malachi 2 verse 16 for the Lord the God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away yep. and then the putting away there and translated in newer versions as divorce God hates divorce why would God hate divorce well because in a divorce in every single divorce somebody is sinning now that doesn't mean that both parties necessary in, in, in some divorces both parties do sin but in every divorce that takes place somebody is sinning 
God hates sin, so God hates divorce. We need to understand that. All right. Uh, why don't we cut it, this one short so we can get on the other side of the break and wrap up in time. But divorce is clearly not acceptable for any and every reason, as we see in our society today. When we get back, we've got three more okay. quick questions without telling you what they are. You'll have to answer them quick when we get back. Don't go anywhere. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. After these important messages, we'll be back to take your comments. Email them during this break. Hi, I'm Wade Shelton. In 1 Peter 3.15, the scripture says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, we believe here at College View that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us. And I believe that we are dedicated to this cause. That's why we here at College View bring you the virtual Bible study each week. Our hope is that you will join us each week here on the virtual Bible study in hopes of strengthening your faith so that you will be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Please join us here every Thursday night on the virtual Bible study. I know that it's worth an hour of your time. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. The number of bankruptcy filings in the United States has steadily increased over the last century and especially since 1980. Bankruptcy filings hit an all-time high in 2005 when more than 2 million cases were started. In that year, one out of every 55 households filed for bankruptcy. The vast majority of bankruptcies are now filed by consumers and not by businesses. In 1980, businesses accounted for 13% of bankruptcies. Today, they account for about 3%. That information is via debt.org. The Word of God says in Romans 13, verse 8, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The Virtual Bible Study. Take it away, guys. We're back as we look at uh, various moral questions and give quick answers for those. Mike J. in the chat room said, uh, is talking about divorce. He says, probably need to also make sure people understand that we're here to please God, not ourselves. I say this in response to a spouse who tries to justify a divorce by saying, God just wants me to be happy. Yeah. It's all about me. Yeah. Uh, good point, Mike. Thank you for that yeah. tonight. All, all right. right. Three more questions and uh, 13 minutes to go. We're going to get done just in time if we stay on it. Okay. Uh, the next question is about telling dirty jokes. I can... I, let me stop this a minute. I want... I want Start that over. You're starting I, over? I, I, I didn't give you the intro yet. So I'm, I'm set. I can see this happening. Oh, this is not, this intro is not. No, no, the intro is not. Okay, well, don't <laughs> ramble too much. Uh, the, the, I'm sitting around a coffee break table at work, and those guys are just terrible to tell dirty jokes. And instead of sitting there and listening to it and laughing about it, it gives me, I could have an opportunity to actually do a little teaching there, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to be quick and to the point because they're not going to sit there. These guys are not inclined to listen to a sermon, but I may be able to tweak their conscience and maybe that'll lead to another discussion. So what am I going to say if I hear people telling dirty jokes? Go. Okay, Kent and Chris both reference Ephesians 5 verse 8 where it talks about neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. We're not supposed to use filthy jesting, uh, of course jesting, or filthy talking. Yeah, that's Ephesians 5, 4. Ephesians Three 5, five four. verse 4. Yeah. Those make very good, that makes very good argument against uh, the idea of telling filthy jokes. Uh, and then, and then uh, Chris also mentioned Colossians 3, verse 8. Colossians 3, verse 8. Uh, I wonder if he doesn't mean verse 6 there. Colossians 3, verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer. No, nope, he means Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now well, you that's yourselves four, that's, that's four, verse six. are going to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, yeah. and blasphemy, filthy there, language out of your mouth. There it is. So that he is right, Colossians 3, 8. But I think Colossians 4, 6 that I read might work with, too. With grace, yeah. yeah let your spe with with speech be with salt. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we could go back to the idea of our influence too. Uh, so I'm supposed to be a Christian, and I'm, I'm supposed to act like I really love the Lord, and I and occasionally try to invite people to go to church with me, And uh, uh, but then I tell dirty jokes. How, I, I, can you, I, there's plenty of ways to destroy your example and your influence, but don't you think that'd be a wonderful way to destroy your influence by being a person with the reputation of one who tells off-color stories and jokes? Uh, yeah. uh, don't do it. And, of course... 
the guy who's doing it won't do it if he doesn't have an audience to listen to it. I think we need to be careful about being the audience, too. Josh? Uh, I was going to mention Ephesians 4 and verse um, 29 says, no, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Verse 31 uh, talks about putting away from you uh, evil speaking. And so I think that I think that could be talking about yeah. dirty jokes right. or anything. And then, and then there's the statement of Jesus, uh, and I didn't think to look this up earlier. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Matthew 12, verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Yeah. And uh, excellent. And uh, Josh, back to what you referenced in Ephesians 4, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It goes on. You quit too early. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, is what I'm talking about. Is it building them up? Is it causing them to be stronger spiritually? Is it causing them to think about things that they shouldn't be thinking about? Or am I displaying an attitude? I mean, not just coarse language, or just anything, I, the way I speak. Am I edifying those who hear it? Okay. All right. All right, now, the, oh, well, let's see. Oh, oh, wait. Hey, here she goes. There right. she blows. Okay. All right. Okay. Two more. Uh, the next one is really closely associated. Christians shouldn't use profanity or take the Lord's name in vain. This is, again, this is something that's going to happen all the time when we're out among when our friends in the, in the world. We're going to have a chance to talk to them because they're going to use bad language and they're especially going to take the Lord's name oh, in vain. Oh, all the time. So what are you going to say to that go? All right. What do you think about that? Uh, we have uh, James 3, verse 10, submitted by Kent. He, and that says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Uh, so there's your profanity. Yeah, and and uh, um, Chris in Atlanta mentions Ephesians five four, which we talked about when we were talking about telling filthy jokes. But he also mentions Exodus chapter twenty verse seven, which everybody should recognize. Exodus chapter twenty, the first part of that is the statement of the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses: Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Yeah. Now that's Old Testament it's law. Old Testament, understand. and not repeated in the New Testament n verbatim. N not not verbatim, but the concept of honoring God and respecting Him, uh, I think, would certainly be absolutely. Out of Hebrews law. chapter two, to serve godly God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We don't yeah. reverence God when we profane His name. It's so sad to me. It seems like. The most common expression of people, and they are not, and they're not religious people. They're not godly people. But their first response, if they get surprised or scared or shocked or happy, is to take God's name in vain. I mean, we hear it all the time by everybody, and uh, and I even hear Christians using expressions that I think really yep. approach that line. You know, euphemisms that are used to substitute for the name of God. Or just an acronym, OMG now, uh, uh, is, uh, and yeah. Christians are using yeah. that. So we, get, we need to stay way far away from that. God, God is to be honored and reverenced, and, and we should not use his name callously or carelessly. Along those lines, Chris references Matthew 6, verse 9, when Jesus in the model prayer says, we're to address God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's not, it's not hallowed, Josh, if I'm just using it flippantly. Right. Uh, I wanted to bring up Psalm 111, verse 9. Uh, it says, He sent redemption into his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. So, same idea. I mean, we're invoking the name of God if we just throw it around loosely. And that's, that's well, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want somebody throwing our name around it in a disgraceful manner, disrespectful. Right. You know, if somebody, if somebody was going to just talk and disrespect your name, your family name, for instance. You'd take offense at that. Mm -hmm. Why would we think God wouldn't take offense when his name is used so recklessly? All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, oh, we got 20 seconds. We'll, we'll grab that 20 seconds. We need it on the okay. next one. Okay. Now, that's 10. We've actually gotten through 10. But understand the premise was not to go in depth, but actually give a first quick response to these important moral issues. And I hope everybody who's listening has said, 
boy, those are some things that do come up pretty often. And if you want an in-depth look at these, I think you can probably find an in-depth look at every one of these in our archives. Exactly right. And if you want an in-depth look again, send us an email and we'll cover any of these in-depth again. And if you disagree with our answers, we can cover them in-depth with you in person if you'd like or even on this program. Okay. The jackpot lottery is up to gazillion million dollars and I'm talking to guys and they're going out and they're buying lottery tickets and I'm going to say you guys you shouldn't be gambling gambling is wrong and they're going to say what come on how are you going to tell how are you going to prove gambling is wrong go well uh, this there's lots of different ways you can approach this question lots of different angles one of them is referenced uh, is approached by Chris he references Ephesians 5 verse 5 for you know this, or for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. And Colossians three five says covetousness is idolatry. So what is covetousness? That's wanting what somebody else has. Yeah, right? it's an inordinate desire to have what others have. And so when I'm gambling, we're all putting up our our stuff or our money, and the other, the person who wins can take it from me. Yeah, it, it, one of the things we have to do when we're talking about this is to identify a gambling proposition. Gambling necessitates a winner and a loser, and that's that, and that's especially what's wrong with gambling is someone has to lose for me to win. Someone says, "Well, investing in the stock market is gambling." It's not because if the stock market goes up, everybody goes up with it. Uh, there doesn't have to be if 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 my if I had a hundred shares at a dollar a piece, I had a hundred dollars worth of this stock, and it went up to two dollars. I doubled my money, but nobody lost money yeah, in order for me to have that. I mean, yeah, if I had a if I had a candy bar and it was fifty cents, but now everybody wants candy bars so much that they're they're buying them for a dollar. I'm not gambled because I had the candy bar and now I can sell it for a dollar. Yeah. No, that's the same with your stock. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you got to. Uh, I think we got to be ready to, to explain what we mean by a gambling proposition, Josh. Yeah, I was looking at First Timothy uh, six, verse seven through ten. Won't read all that, but uh, it talks about in verse eight having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. And then verse ten talks about the love of money. Um, so, you know, we're supposed to be good stewards of what we've been given. And I don't think I think the problem with it is greed and and wanting to get money. And so I, if I you know if I hit the lottery, I won't ever have to work again. You know, you hear yeah. people say that I can just sit at home and take it easy, and that's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to be greedy and loving money. If we do that, uh, it talks about some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Exactly so right. It's condemned. Exactly right. right. Uh, he re- uh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Well, he references. Verse 13, verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Certainly those who are gambling are not. And uh, the, the so-called golden rule, Matthew 7, verse 12, do uh, uh, what all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, even so do ye to them, for this is the law of the prophets. To win at gambling, someone has to lose. Uh, I don't want them taking what I have. Why should I take what they have? Gamble, there, there are actually three legitimate methods of transferring money or, or wealth in the Bible, labor, Ephesians 4, verse 28, exchange, trade, barter, Acts 4, verse 32 and following. So you can work for what you get, you can trade f- things of equal value for what uh-huh. you get, or you can re- receive a gift, but gambling is not one of those. And Kent uh, from uh, Georgia references Ephesians 5, uh, 4, 28. Let him who st- still still no longer, but rather rather let him labor, working with his hands that which is good, that he may have something to give to him as in need. All right. There's lots of other angles we could use to address the gambling question, but uh, I think that gets the job done. Yeah. And we're out of time. Right on time. Right on time. Well, but it's we a good thing it. we had that timer running, or we would have never, never made it. Never made it. Uh, and again, we'll repeat, if you would like to have these things discussed in more detail, send us an email. We'd love to uh, address them. We could even address them again on this program if uh, the need is there and the interest is there. And if you've got other moral topics, that we didn't cover them all by any means. If you have other moral questions that you'd like to have answers for, we can address those. Send them in to questions at collegeview.com. Exactly right. Josh, thank you for your time tonight and for your quick answers. Yeah, that's you right. Were quick on the that, well, that, was, that, that went fast. Yeah. All right. We didn't get all the answers. Josh had more answers ready that we didn't get to. Uh, but uh, all right, we appreciate those, Josh. Dad, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you for being here. Hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word, and hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, 
Study his inspired word of the Bible and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.